Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for coming. It's difficult days in Paris, and it's like two lectures in a row. Uh, so today is my concluding lecture, in case of I see some new faces. So basically, I was talking about different aspects of, uh, of uh, mathematical aspects of studying of active matter. And I was mostly talking about cell motility examples and uh, how to model active gels. And today, I will focus on uh, suspensions of active swimmers. And uh, I will talk about homogenization approach, how to use it. And uh, I will give you some general idea about what this approach does. And also, I'll tell you about one. I start from a recent project which uh, precisely describes swimmers, uh, bacterial swimmers in, in mucus. OK? All right. Let's see. OK, so let me start from the old story. That's how I get to, to the active matter. Uh, this was when I visited Chicago and I saw this experiment when you, instead of passive particles, you measure effective viscosity of swimming bacteria and effective viscosity, very surprisingly at the, ta at the time, dropped like factor seven or something like that. And then we, uh, we spent several years with Igor uh, and my other collaborators try, trying to develop mathematics which would explain this. So that shows you what mathematics can do for you in this, in this case. Uh, so this black terms, it's effective viscosity. Eta naught is viscosity of ambient fluid. Eta hat is viscosity of effective viscosity of suspension. Phi is concentration. And this is a celebrated Einstein formula. So what we derive, we derive this active term. But not just we, there is some active term. Everything is in here. Like, for example, elongation or diffusion, which corresponds to tumbling. So you can, uh, you can actually uh, share the strength of cell propulsion gamma. You can see how each parameter and G of lambda, it's something which is directly related to length of bacterium. So you can see all ingredients and how precisely they quantitatively contribute. All right? So that's, that's the idea of explicit formulas. That's why I wanted to show it. And <clears throat> today, uh, I'll start from recent experiments which were done in our lab at Penn State where Igor and I founded this uh, Center for Mathematics of Living and Mimetic Matter. So Igor is in charge of experiments, and I'm in charge of theory. So this bacteria is swimming in liquid crystal, and uh, there are several interesting effects. Bacteria form, form trains, uh, then bacteria swim back faster uh, than, than the right direction, they borrow some sort of tunnels, which is memory effects. Uh, there is some movie, but I'm not sure if I start messing up this movie, maybe I better not. Uh, okay, I just tell you. So, uh, and why liquid crystal? Because basically uh, there are uh, experimental evidence that mucus, uh, like many biofluids, isotropic, in anisotropic, and Actually, liquid crystalline medium, even without viscoelasticity, but even more so with viscoelasticity, very well describes certain property, which, again, I can refer to some papers. But for now, I just tell you that that's, that's why liquid crystal. OK, and uh, several things which we observed uh, when bacteria swims in liquid crystal, critical value of anchoring. Anchoring is how, uh, how uh, the surface of bacteria uh, connects to liquid crystal. W, this anchoring strength. And what we found, previous paper was for spherical 
particle. It was either this way for pushers or for pullers that way. And we found critical anchoring for elongated swimmers of the same for either pusher or puller when one behavior is changing. And we did it both experimentally and theoretically. So we have ways of developing theoretical models. Okay, now, uh, the other factor which is important in description of this kind of problem, now I'm talking about collective behavior. This was individual, I don't know if you can see well, but this is bacteria moving along preferred direction with long range uh, orientational order. So, basically, uh, the idea here is to see how collective behavior emerges from individual behavior and in particular, we want to focus on statistical description of collective behavior. For example, distribution of probabilistic distribution of velocities. Randomness, I will use randomness a lot today because obviously uh, there is lack of information one way or another, either in measurements, we discussed it yesterday with uh, people here, or uh, or uh, degrees of freedom, or other things, okay? Uh, so, and the point is that we want to find minimal model that's amenable to analysis and still capture key physical phenomenon. So, one of the key observation uh, when we start theoretical studies is that whereas how to model fluid, for example. Uh, it's known for 100 years. There is Navier-Stokes equation. You can ask 100 questions of Navier-Stokes and, and make, can get many answers. But when we just started, even in Newtonian fluid, when we just started to study uh, the this, this swimmers, we notice that for effective viscosity, for this formula which I showed, we use the dipoles model, dipoles model of force dipole, and simple delta function. But then we ask for the same bacterial system. We ask different question. What, how clusters form at the onset of collective behavior? It's the same system, but this model of cell propulsion is, didn't work anymore. We had to develop different model. To capture. So in other words, the, the key at the time striking feature for me was that the modeling, unlike in classical physics, you can ask Ginsburg Landau model or Alan Kohn, many, many questions. Here, there are many models and models has to be attached to, uh, to the question and specifically the, the most important key link is how to model self-propulsion. And uh, for collective behavior, we model it using force dipole. For individual swimmers, we introduce the swimmer velocity and then translational and rotational velocity, but it didn't work, for example, for collective. The mathematical technique cannot, cannot deal with that. And uh, this, this picture just shows that I, our dipole model, one is experimentally measured A, and B is theoretically uh, like computation numerics for this force dipole, and they're pretty, they're pretty good. They, so it's a, it's a good model. All right, so let's say the Edwards, it's called edwards berry model of liquid crystal. This is a little bit heavy, so if you can capture all the details, that's fine. I'll tell you, uh, so there is velocity field, which is like Stokes equation with, this is elastic stress, and this is dipoles, this is activities here. And there is something called Q tensor order Q tensor, which characterizes anisotropy of fluid. I told you because we are after mucus at the end, and uh, Q tensor captures anisotropy. I can, I was, let me just see if I can show what Q tensor does. 
because it's kind of important. So if P, if P is a probability distribution of position and orientations, right, just like density in Boltzmann equation, that's P satisfies this condition. And you can compute first zero moment. And because of uh, odd property, first moment vanishes. And second moment, M. And this is moment of isotropic. This is for uniform distribution, when distribution is constant. So Q tensor is difference between second moment uh, of uniform distribution, isotropy, and actual distribution. So it just shows that Q tensor, the, the meaning of Q tensor is uh, degree of anisotropy in this sense. Okay? So, so this is the model, and one has to pay attention to models. So equation is stocks with additional elasticity. Uh, then 50 is torque balance for liquid crystal molecules. Uh, H of Q is first variation of landau degen energy. And S is stretching and rotating effects of liquid crystals due to the flow. So there are some boundary conditions on, on squimmer. And there is anchoring boundary condition, as I told you. How this, what is, what is the connection between squimmer? Squimmer is a swimmer. Squimmer and, and liquid crystal and W, this answer, this is a preferred direction. This is, this is a preferred Q. And, uh, and then there is also balance of forces, including dipoles, and balance of torques. So those are force and torque balance. So that would be a full model. Okay, and the question is how to do homogenization of this model, and I will explain you how to basically upscale it. This is, this is micro, micro, microscopic model because it has many small particles. How to upscale it? That is the question, and I will explain you what it means and uh, give you a little bit excurs in homogenization theory. So, so the methods which we are it's a current work which I started in the fall uh, with Paris 6 uh, researchers, Antoine Gloria and Mitya Duenrix, uh, and uh, we are using homogenization techniques. Now I will spend some time telling you what it is, okay? What is just a brief overview. So there are many names for this, most common coarse graining and upscaling methods. There are some sort of average, but typically simple averaging in this kind of problem, like mean field, it doesn't work. So that's why homogenization are more sophisticated techniques. And what it, at the end of the, of, the, of the day, it could give you macroscopic description, particularly uh, like effective rheology, and, uh, and it should be consistent with other physical techniques, like self-consistency scheme, etc. Okay, so uh, basically, now, now I forget about liquid crystal, bacteria. Now I'm actually going to switch to my iPad, because my computer was not working, so I prepared some notes poorly written, but on iPad. And if maybe I will even use Blackboard, we'll see how it goes. So basically, here is the idea, in a nutshell, the very simple idea of homogenization. So uh, you take, uh, this is inclusion, so one conductivity or thermal conductivity, and this is matrix or background. And you replace it by homogeneous media. And how this effective conductivity of this homogeneous media, of course, it depends on sigma 1 and sigma 2. But most importantly, it depends on microstructure, namely distribution, spatial distribution of inclusions, their <coughs> shape, and it could be typically lack of information, noise in measurements, so unknown degrees of freedom. So that's, that's what it is. Okay? All right. All right, so uh, now let me switch 
try to see how it works. Let me switch to my iPad. Okay, so this is, so basically here I have again, I have, first of all, I have two scales. This is a simple case. It's this multi-scale, it could be many, infinitely many. But the simplest case, my idea, uh, what, what I'm trying to do, my goal is present everything in the simplest possible setting so that you can follow, all right? So this is capital L, this is size of specimen or sample, and this is small l, let's say size of particle. And epsilon is very small, the ratio. Then the scales are called well separated. And that's the first necessary condition for homogenization. Now, the simplest equation which describes this kind of media, which I, I draw for you, this kind of, uh, <coughs> Let me, maybe I can even write now on that. So, remember I told you I have this inclusions. So, this is the equation, let's say for potential, or thermal potential, and this function, sigma, it's a conductivity, but it's rapidly oscillating, right? Is that clear? Why it's rapidly, sigma y, it taken value of sigma one. Sigma y now is in a cell of size one. But when I, instead of y, I plug x over epsilon, it's like sine x over epsilon. It started rapidly oscillate, all right? And that corresponds to many, many inclusions which are very, very small, all right? Okay, so, and this blown up cell of periodicity of size one is called unit periodicity cell. And this is a very important building block in homogenization theory, all right? Okay, so what I'm trying to do, I'm trying to replace my solution of my original problem, which is u epsilon. Remember when there are many, many inclusions and this rapidly oscillating coefficients, I'm trying to replace it mathematically by solution of a problem with constant coefficient like this media and, and u naught. That's what's called homogenized or upscaled problem. Solving this problem numerically, and why do I want to do that? Because when your coefficients are like crazy, oscillating like crazy, it's very hard to solve this problem numerically. Right, it's obvious. But when they're constant, you can do this. And the question is, how good is this approximation, right? And there are two questions here. One is how u epsilon approximates u naught, but usually you're not interested in this. Usually you are interested in, uh, in gradient. So this is relatively easy. From considering energy, you can immediately derive this in, in L2 norm in mean square. But for gradients, it becomes much more complicated. It's not, it just doesn't work. You, you epsilon and you not, they don't converge. This is not true, okay? And then the big idea which came in mathematics in, uh, actually, I think I, I did, I, I had even slide on history. Let me just, before, let me go, let me just, Say the history of this. Uh, okay, the history of homogenization. Because it's, it's really interesting. Let's see how it works. Okay, so it goes back, it's, it's on shoulders of giants. <laughs> so for conductivity problem, Poisson and then later Faraday studied effective conductivity with conducting spheres and non-conducting matrix. Then Maxwell, uh, and they all studied something which called dilute limit, when volume fraction of this inclusion is very small, meaning that sizes of inclusions are much smaller than distances between them, right? Because that's a big help. 
Because basically, then you study single inclusion in infinite medium, right? Okay. So uh, then the next big step was Einstein, effective viscosity again for dilute suspension of spherical particles. And it took what to, to go to interactions from this to this, to 72, bachelor and green. So that's how difficult it is to, to take into account next term, which is responsible for interactions. And then Jeffrey also, the guy who did Jeffrey orbits, he did in 22, also 15 years, just from spherical to ellipsoidal particles. Now, mathematical theory, but this is, they mostly did, they just guessed the form of solution in infinite media, and that's how they derive, okay? And the idea was to create machinery, to create machinery. What is the machinery? Which you give me any problem, and there is my method, like computational methods, and how do I upscale? And that started in 1964. Those guys, Marchenko and Kruslov in Ukraine, in Kharkiv, Keller in, in New York, in uh, NYU, and then Fredlin was in Moscow University, and they simultaneously try to develop mathematical approach. Keller actually, he beautifully solved explicitly effective conductivity of checkerboard, of black and white squares, a found explicit formula. So it's a very particular problem, but because of explicit formula, it can be used to verify numerical codes. It was very interesting. And, and quite opposite, Marchenko and Khruslov developed very, very generic approach, heavy one based on uh, capacity of inclusions, and Freidlin also used some parabolic equations like heat equation. Okay, and then in 1780s, it was simultaneous activity in, in Courant Institute uh, in France by Jacques-Louis Lyons, who wrote a book with Varadan and Papa Nicolaou, and then in, in, in Soviet Union, Kozlov and Alenik for periodic homogenization, and later for random homogenization. That's the history. Okay, and by now, it's still a very active area. Most, Current focus is mostly on random homogenization because it's much harder. And I'll tell you, I'll give you a little bit of review. Okay, now I switch back to my iPad. Okay, so the big idea here which gave all this sets mathematically things in motion was introduction of slow and fast x over e variables. So instead of looking for solution, what would you do? You have u epsilon of x, right? And usually you write epsilon to the 0, u0 of x, plus epsilon to the 1, u1 of x, right? That's a usual perturbation expansion. That's how people solve using perturbation expansion. However, Poincaré notice for ODEs, for ordinary differential equation, not for PDEs, uh, that introducing fast and slow time could help tremendously. And then that leads to the following expansion, which I just wrote to you. Instead of this, you write u naught of x, x over epsilon plus epsilon, u1 of x, x over epsilon plus, etc. So each, fu each function ui, is function of x and y. And it's periodic, periodic in the second. So this y varies, say, in unit square, all right? And y would, when you plug instead of y, x over epsilon, it becomes fast variable. Is that clear? Now, simple illustration of this would be the following. Let's consider this periodic medium. 
Those are neighboring cells, and those are cells very far away. Now, if I take a point here, which is, and a point here, which is similarly located, right? Then if my function is u over x, x over y, in this variable it's periodic, but change of this variable for two neighboring in slow variable, it's nothing. So value here, it's almost the same as value here. But if I consider incidental point here, which, again, but in a very far away, then it's not at all the same, all right? So that's the idea of, of this special ansatz. When you do any kind of asymptotics, the key thing is to guess the form of ansatz. And once you do it, then things fall into place. Okay? So, so here, I told you u1, and the first homogenization result, okay, what are the questions here? The question here, first find this is effective conductivity, right? This is a constant conductivity of grain media, okay? Then, then again approximation. Okay, so, now I'm about to introduce the key hero in this. This is all about periodic homogenization. For, for like 20 years, what Leons was doing here, Papa Nicolau, was about periodic homogenization. Because it's a reasonable approximation. And then it switched to, to random homogenization. And now random is more, more of a focus, all right? So, this is a problem for one single blown up cell. Sigma y, this conductivity, which is sigma 1, this is a cell of size 1. Okay? So, solving numerically this problem is not, a, is not difficult because you actually, uh, you don't have small parameters. There is no epsilon here. Right? There is no rapid oscillation, okay? So solving this problem is easy. And if dimension is d, there are d problem, e i is a unit vector. So the same equation, it's like, for example, if sigma 1 is equal to sigma 2, do you see what the solution would be? It would be just coordinate function, y i, right? But when they start to deviate, you just correct from linear, you, you, you choose whatever is best approximation given that sigma one is not equal to sigma two. All right? Okay, so, so the, the, this is called cell problem on a unit periodicity cell. And once you solve this cell problem, what I wrote here is Formula, this is effective conductivity. It's basically, it's found by energies functional of, of cells. So you have cell problems, chi i, chi j, if it's a tensor, if it's not isotropic, if it's isotropic, it's just one chi i. So that's, that's effective conductivity, all right? However, I told you that the while this is, goes to zero, this is nothing. What we need, current, and for that, for that to happen, we need to construct, we need to find u1. So what is true? This is not true, but what is true, if you take u0 and then you add u1, epsilon u1, you add second term in the expansion, then, then actually uh, you have 
convergence of this norm with, uh, with derivatives. Then you, can, you have convergence with the derivative, right? So this is the key hero then. This is called corrector U1 because it it's provides you the approximation with derivative stresses. You're not interested in displacement. You're not interested in velocities, in fluids. You're interested always in derivatives, right? So you always need the corrector. And the very important observation that corrector can be constructed in the following form. This is u1 of x and y. This is this function. It depends only on solution of cell problems. Remember, cell problem is something which does not have small parameter. You only have to solve it once numerically, and then you can do anything. Okay? And it's u0. And solving u0, u0 solves the problem with constant coefficients. So u0 is also easy and cheap to solve numerically. Is that clear? So u0, so that's the corrector. The corrector is also can be computed without resolving fine scales. So it's only, it does not, numerically solving, finding corrector does not require fine scales. Right? Okay. So, Okay, any questions here? So this is, so what we learned once we did the right ansatz and we can compute, the, that was a big brace, breakthrough, compute the corrector. Okay, and corrector provides you convergence or approximation property. All right, okay. Now, uh, so what, what, is, what is then the result? Let me go back to to what we studied. We started from this, this problem of rapidly oscillating coefficients, right? And then with many inclusions, and then we replace this problem by the problem with constant coefficients, whose solution is u naught. And then we said that we now, if we, want, if we know how to solve this cell problem, we can find coefficient sigma hat. And we can find approximation to our u naught with, with the derivatives. All right? So basically, once you solve, and there are d, in dimension d, there are d cell problems. OK, let me, again, this is the cell problem. Uh -huh. Okay, okay, sigma could be tensor. Uh, it's, it depends. If originally it was an isotropic, let's say originally it was a square. It, it, for simplicity, it, it could be tensor, but it doesn't have to be. It could be scalar. And then, have and then I have divergence sigma of u, and then this is, this is unknown function, kappa i. Yes. And this is unit vector, e is 0, 0, 1. So it's like gradient of, of yi function. You can put here in the right-hand side gradient of yi. Right? Is that clear? And what is this basic, I mean, the basic thing you're solving to? You define it as conductivity? OK. Um, so this is sort of conductivity problem with periodic on a unit cell of periodicity. This is auxiliary. This is not the real conductivity problem which I'm solving. What I did, I extracted out of my, that's a very good question. I extracted out of my huge periodic medium, I took one, one little cell, okay? I blew it up like one over epsilon. And I consider problem with very special boundary conditions. It only depends on material. They don't know right-hand side of sources. They only capture the shape of inclusions, one periodicity cell. They do not, the end material parameters, sigma. Sigma is original conductivity. 
sigma 1 and sigma 2. For example, here it could be sigma 1 and sigma 2. But it could be a tensor. I just want to make it simpler. Okay? And then the position of the conductivity is from this equation that you can write. What? what? And, I mean, this is, when you say conductivity, this is generally something that satisfies this equation. Yeah, when I say conductivity, when I say conductivity, exactly, when I say conductivity, it's When I say conductivity, it's a coefficient in this, okay, divergence sigma of x grad phi is equal whatever, f, right? It's a, it's equation for electrostatic potential. This is, could be thermal conductivity if it's temperature. This could be electrostatic, right? This is a coefficient, rapidly oscillating coefficient. Thanks, I want it because it's, a, it's important not to miss what cell problem is. Because cell problem is the key to everything. You see, it allows you to find both effective conductivity, overall this constant macroscopic property, but most importantly, it allows you to construct the corrector. So approximation. This approximation, I told you, it's, it's chi i are solutions of k. There are d cell problems. Because unit vector, uh, it depends. In dimension D, there are D unit, different unit vectors. But they know nothing about right-hand side, like source term, which can vary. So once you have your material properties and geometry, you have to solve D cell problem, and then you're totally in business. OK? Now, the way to solve those cell problem is either, in general, it's numerics, which is much simpler because there is no epsilon anymore. There is no rapid oscillations. There is no fine scale. Basically, in a nutshell, homogenization is a numerical, is a technique to find the course of fine scales. Right? That's what we are doing. All right. And, uh, okay. And then there is one very special case where you can actually, and I've done quite a bit of work on that, uh, when you can find explicit solutions of cell problem, when conductivities are very different. And for elastic problem, it was my main achievement 30 years ago, or very, you, you consider young model is very stiff and very, very uh, soft, and in the limit you obtain negative Poisson ratio, asymptotically, you can compute it. I published math, math paper on that which was supported by experiment. So in order to compute something, you have to have a small parameter, analytically. But what I'm saying, so here is our summary. Cell problem, cell problem for both effective, effective rheology, whatever it is. A conductivity, just a case study. It could be fluids, it could be elasticity, it could be anything. For now, linear, okay? And approximation. It's all due to self problem, right? But this part is due to a very clever ansatz, which many people developed in 60s and notice how it works, right? And how to solve it, either Numerics, numerics, but it's much simpler with no fine scales. Fine scales. Or asymptotics, asymptotics in high contrast. High contrast means when properties of inclusions and media are very different conducting inclusions, rigid particles in the fluid, and things like that. Then you can go all the way even without having dilute limit. You can actually, and you can obtain, as I said, that's how I obtain, I actually obtain zero Poisson ratio out of two finite, and then people did it different methods, all right? Okay, any questions so far? This was tremendously helpful. Yeah, because, okay, that is, Okay, next question. What is next question? Um, so, okay, let me just erase. So here is what I would like to tell you. So for now, 
we have dealt with periodic media, and you can argue that not too many media are periodic. Now, to describe a little bit where we stand, what to do with random media? This is question. And next question would be nonlinear non problems. Because that's nice decomposition into N cell problems is because of linearity. It's clearly linearity somewhere on the background. But if there is no linearity, it will be much more complicated. All right? So, OK. Let me talk a little bit about randomness. OK. So now my coefficients, I know I denote them capital X over epsilon. They're not necessarily periodic. They're just some oscillating functions. But there is omega, it's element of probability space. So it's a realization when you throw your coin, whatever it is. Okay? And uh, therefore, because coefficients are random, So it goes back to a basic notion of random variable. There is a probability space, space of elementary outcome, and then there's probability measure on it. Okay? And then the solution also is random. Right? Simple example, that's what Keller introduced, is a motion from periodic checkerboard to a random checkerboard. When every square, you take, you toss a coin, and this probability P is white, and this probability 1 minus P is black. OK, you can imagine. This is a pre if you are far away, this is a pretty good description of random media with concentration P. Is that clear? You will far away, you won't see this. You would see black islands in white sea or vice versa. Right? So it's a, and, and it's, a, it's a good model. Random checkerboard is a good model because it allows for some explicit calculations. And you, <coughs> you want it as a benchmark for numerical codes. Is that clear? All right. Uh, okay, so this is periodic checkerboard. Now, there are some other conditions which my coefficients. So now this is what? Divergence A of x over epsilon y gradient u epsilon of x omega is equal f. So this coefficients a of y omega, this is now a random, this is something which is called random field. If y is one dimensional time, it's going to be just random process. So it's a one parameter family of random variables. Am I using a lot of? So random variable is like simple it's zeta of omega. For any outcome, you have a number. OK, that's a random variable. But if it's a family, depending on time, that's called random process. And random field in when y is multidimensional. OK, for example, field of temperature. Y would be a special variable. It's a, some body of dimension d, and y is a point, and then the temperature, the value of temperature is random, which is determined by this omega. OK? All right, so the condition here, there are two important conditions for homogenization. One is stationarity, 
and the other is ergodicity. So stationarity means that this distribution is invariant A of X of Y plus tau omega and A of Y tau Y omega. Whenever you shift in space, you consider not this point, but distribution in a different point is the same. Is that clear? So distribution, and you measure temperature in a 3D body in different points, and you always have the same histograms, probabilistically. Okay? That's stationarity. Now, ergodicity means that spatial average, I mean, it's, it's more than that, but it's just a consequence most, is equal expectation. Probabilistic average or expectation. How you can think of this is the following. You have a body, and you heat it, okay? And you have like random field of temperature. Special, spatial average, you take many, many points, and you average temperature over many, many points. That would be special, spatial. Is that clear? Now, alternatively, you can fix just one point and then took many, many specimens. Then it would be statistic ta taken at one point but, or during long time. That would be average in probability. That would be probabilistic average. And if these two averages are the same, that's it's not strictly system, it's not ergodic, but it's most important property of ergodic system. Special average, I don't know how to, I don't want to go into technicalities. Mm -hmm. was, we need to ask a question. Is your disorder frozen in time, which means if I go at a given point, do I always have the same random field? Or is it fluctuating? No, no, for now, for now it's, it's, it's a frozen in time. The time, time I can add it's later. Quenched, it's a it's a quench disorder for not for now not yes I can do that because I'm, I'm trying to explain ideas and that's a very good question of course now I, I can do also uh, it's a quench disorder I can do evolution but evolution immediately adds another layer of difficulties as it always does same even for moving particles in the fluid right you start evolutional problems when part of it's it's much harder it's, it's adds nonlinearity. It's when you, when you add another way of also answering it, when you add uh, to quench disorder evolution, it adds nonlinearity to the problem. And that's why mathematically it would be much harder. Excellent question. Yeah. Okay. All right. So now, what can we do with this? What can we do with this? Uh, okay, so. Actually, the result is very similar. And remember, my key problem was cell problem. The result is very sim similar. This solution, u epsilon, u epsilon of x omega, it converges to some solution of x omega, and this is x over epsilon omega of x omega, and these derivatives, and the, you not solve the same equation, divergence uh, a hat, which is a constant, constant matrix, not constant, non-random, non-random, of, uh, and then it's a gradient u naught of x, and there is no probability, and this is equal g of x, the same right-hand side as here, it was also g of, uh, g of x, all right? So it looks the same. 
However, there is also this question, how to compute a hat? And remember, we compute a hat by integrating, finding energy of cell problems, right? Okay, let me remind you, sigma hat was in this. This was a formula. Sigma ij, it's energy, uh, chi, chi i are solutions of the cell problems. See questions in your eyes? No? No, in, in rubs. No, no, I'm just comparing. I'm going back. No, no, I mean in, in the result that you wrote. Oh, 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 in this result, yes. It's averaged out. It's self-averaging. <laughs> it, because of ergodicity and stationarity, exactly. Because of this, precisely. That's a very good question. That's why I need these conditions. And I, I more even need stationarity. Stationarity, it's more important than ergodicity. Roughly speaking, it means that Everything is translationally equivalent. That's why I'm able to do this. In general, of course, not. Yeah, yeah. You know, my students know that if I look in their eyes and they say, I understand, but I always can see if there is a question. I don't <laughs> use it <laughs> in talks, but that's what I can do. I can stop a random person on the street, ask directions, and I can see when the person confidently tell me, I can see, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> this is not. Anyways, uh, so, okay, so this was the result. The result is that we have the same uh, non-random equation, which is easy to solve with constant coefficients. But the question is how to find these coefficients, right? And the key challenge, which was resolved by in PhD thesis by Kozlov. Uh, this was very remarkable Russian mathematician. Actually, he was working on his thesis on a different stochastic processes with Vishik, famous advisor. And then one day, uh, Jacques-Louis Lyons came to Moscow and gave a talk on homogenization and control. And Kozlov immediately went to his advisor, said, I'm switching topic. I'm only working in homogenization. And then he took this challenge uh, in his PhD. And the other was Papa Nikolaou, who was director of Current Institute, and Varadan, previous director. Those are members of all academies. And they also, in parallel, in the United States, they develop understanding of random homogenization. And the key issue, of course, is what is the analog, analog of cell problem? Because there is no periodicity anymore, right? What is it? And how to deal with it, okay? And, <clears throat> okay, any questions so far? Okay. So now the corrector problem is written here. So it reminds you, same ki, but we have here now omega probability, but most importantly, it's in the entire space, Rn, because there is no periodicity cell. So that makes it much more complicated, all right? However, the, the big help is that this problem, this corrector problem, has to be solved only for a typical, typical realization. So you don't have to solve it for all omegas. There is typical realization is something which is in occurs with probability one. Okay. So you, you find at least one such like coloring of checkerboard, and you only solve for that. But still, of course, you have to truncate it. Uh, OK, this is a definition of special average I wrote here. So you have to take, instead of integrating over cell of periodicity, you have to take 
special air average, which is like thermodynamic limit. You have a box and you send size of the box to infinity and divide by size of this box, okay? Uh, so, so in practice, how, how do you solve such a problem? In practice, of course, you solve it in a box of L size, right? And the question, the practical question is the following. Uh, so in reality, you don't, in, in practice, you don't determine a hat, but you determine something which I wrote here. A, so AL is when you, instead of infinite, you consider box L by L, okay, with the same distribution, but also you kind of average over N, N realizations. So this is, this could be viewed as a law of large numbers. It's like law of large numbers, right? So you take this LN and then this is what subject of much more current research. That's what these pe people do in Paris in Max Planck. How close this approximation would be to this a hat? We didn't have this question at all in periodic setting, right? And there are some very good estimates, like one over n, and it's not surprising why it's one over square root of n, because somewhere law of large numbers in the background, right? And then, there is L to the power minus D, where D is dimension, right? So this is just a little bit of flavor what happens with random homogenization. If, for example, your, your swimmers are Poissonian distribution. I had a paper uh, long ago when I had defects in crystal which are distributed by Poisson, special defects, and then I proved that distribution of stresses would be Lorentz curve. And it would be shifted Lorentz. I computed this shift. And uh, I had like several papers with experimentalists. They observed this in experiments with, with crystals. But that's a rare luck when you can actually com contribute di uh, compute distribution. Usually, it's not. It's like some average properties, right? It's, it's like checkerboard or something, a special luck. So usually you have ALN would be your for random media, would be your final product, and you have to be concerned. And then, so the first question is law of large numbers, and the second question would be what is the distribution of this error? That would be like central limit theorem. And you can also do that, all right? So I'm just giving you a flavor of what random homogenization does. Because what we do for these uh, swimmers, uh, bacteria swimming in liquid crystal, we apply this technique of random homogenization. Some quantities are self-averaging, which means you can take your whole system, divide it into boxes, mm -hmm. and calculate, say that the, uh, the average over the whole system is uh, the average among the boxes. Do you use things? Additivity, additivity, right? Well, uh, that's... Here, conductivity, if you have mesoscopic boxes, so that's, so what Jean-Francois is bringing this on my next uh, slide, I think, here, is something called representative volume element. Oh, well, that's here, concept of representative volume element. So basically what people also do in practice, you have this huge random media. And you find, exactly, you find a box, and the question is, what is the size of the box, which is sort of contains all randomness, and by repeating it, you don't gain much more information. This is called techniques representative volume elements, right? But that's for additivity, and I told you, for example, for questions like percolation questions, I told you there is no additivity. There is quantities which are, and in nonlinear problems, it would be also no additivity. But here it would be additivity in, in conductivity, in any linear problem, in stocks. Right? Excellent question. Is that clear? 
So you find this window and the size is, what is the size of this window? That depends on correlations. So if you know correlations of your field, you can determine the size of this window and then you're done. Okay? That's, that's how it works in practice. Okay, so, so what did we cover by now? We cover original start, dilute, which is classics, when it's basically one inclusion, no interactions, and yet the giants, Maxwell, Faraday, uh, Faraday, Rayleigh, Raleigh, they all work on that. So it was really important question. And uh, actually, Raleigh did mathematical proof using complex variables and also even for random distribution. Okay? Uh, then Einstein, and then, then this machinery for periodicity. Then the key is cell problem, which allows, which has no small fine scales. You solve it and you can reconstruct your solution. Okay? And then the next step was what what when everything is, becomes random, but kind of uniformly random? Then you, otherwise, to your question, it could be A of X here. It could be slowly variable function. But that's another layer of difficulty. I want to give you just an idea. So stationarity is basically, and visergodicity provides you self-averaging. Okay? All right. Now, <clears throat> What remains, maybe I'll talk a little bit about that, and then maybe I'll talk more about... Uh, but I thought that this would be even more important than just talk about our <coughs> results, specific results, because it's like very basic, and, and, and sometimes the two cultures, they don't percolate into each other, physics and this development in mathematics, there is a lot of tools developed for random homogenization recently. All right, so uh, now let me give you a flavor of nonlinear non homogenization. So basically here, if I, if I start from my original problem, remember was this divergence sigma of x over epsilon gradient u epsilon equal g. You can write in a variational form, just like minimization of energy, right, of quadratic energy. But then, in certain class of function with certain boundary condition. But then the, the very next question, what if my energy is not quadratic? Okay? And even worst case scenario, so, and then what is it about general energy? So just f of x over epsilon, rapidly oscillated epsilon, and then this. So what I will tell, I will talk a little bit about this problem, and I will set aside, if I have time, I will talk a little bit. There is two, again, layers of difficulty. Once you go from linear deterministic problem to nonlinear, there is a lot of issues added, but then if your energy is convex, your life is still much easier. If it's non-convex, then, then the cell problem Again, it's one more layer of difficulty, which is resolved. I can talk about that. There will be a, a little special course, and I have a small book about this for beginning graduate students. You can read it where I try to, like, for example, nonlinear problems, I analyze in 1D case so that you can clearly see the ideas. And then, and then of course, there is random nonlinear energies that's something which combines this understanding of representative volume element and this kind of things. So basically, uh, here is the cell problem in 1D. So now I'm talking about periodic in 1D linear problem would be uh, periodic rod, right? With conductivity sigma 1 and sigma 2. But then you can consider random rod or you consider nonlinear rod. And then 
Then this is, this is segment 0, 1. In all this problem, the, the idea of my book is just to make, to put everything in the simplest possible setting, like we talked about in this minimal model. Now, my effective Lagrangian, or effective, uh, this is f, f hat, it's a function of lambda, and I'll tell you what lambda is. And uh, chi so you have to solve, you have to minimize problems with with, uh, instead of gradient u here, you have something which depends on parameter lambda. So basically, one thing is that when we had periodic, when we had linear problem, I had d cell problems. I fixed boundary, zero, one boundary condition, and it's a standard cell problem. If I can solve d of them, I can construct anything because of linearity because of superposition. Now superposition is not applied. So I have to, I have a family of, one parameter family of cell problems. Non, so now remember, cell problem is the key to everything. And you have to understand to move from periodic to random, you have to, the first question, what is, what is this uh, cell problem for random? Now here is family, one parameter, family of cell problems. So you basically have to discretize in this, so, so that's computationally, it adds, adds a difficulty, all right? And I won't even, <clears throat> I, I won't even talk about so for randomness, it's more or less the same. It's just instead of you have typical realization, it's more or less the same, except you have infinite, uh, infinitely many one parameter family of cell problems. The, the real difficulty comes, which I don't address, but it has been resolved when energy becomes non-convex. Then this additional degree of freedom due to non-convexity, and that's something I decided not to cover because it's already Okay, okay, so uh, that's probably all what I wanted to say about random homogenization, about homogenization and random homogenization. Maybe, look, what is happening? Okay, now in the remaining five minutes, so how much should I finish in five minutes? Oh. Okay, let's see how much patience the audience has though. So, so now I'm back to suspensions. Something which I started, remember my swimmers, swim either in the water or in liquid crystal, right? And uh, there are four challenges here. One is dilute versus non-dilute. I told you already, right? Dilute, that's why people did it 200 years ago, because you can just consider one. But if it's non-linear, even dilute becomes a problem. And I'll demonstrate you why. And with what, we, what we did as of now, we solved this swimmers in liquid crystal for dilute limit. But there is no single solution. You have to glue them together, I'll, I'll tell you. Then dynamics. Dynamics is nightmare because it's at what Jean-Francois was asking about quenching disorder. Still, when particles start to move, it's another, another nonlinearity. Okay? And finally, randomness. So let me just very quickly, okay, this is dilute we were talking about, Einstein, beyond correlations, I told you that you, you, you can add correlation interaction, that took 70 years. Now, how do, how do we deal? This is particularly from our current work on, on swimmers, on active swimmers in mucus. So, in linear fluids, I told you linear superposition, but here what we do, we, we take every swimmer and we attach to its center Voronoi cell. Voronoi cell is the following. It's a, if you have 
distribution of points, let's say, in the plane. You attach to every point, oh, here is my blue. You attach to every point all points which are closer to this point than to any other point. And it gives you a tessellation, which is called Voronoi tessellation. Voronoi tessellation. Right? And then, so what we did, we did this Voronoi tessellation of this fluid domain. And instead of, and we solve, we find solution in, in this, only in this Voronoi cells, not in infinite. But then we have to glue them together. And when we glue them together, you make an error. And this would contribute to error of approximation. And that's very interesting thing. Uh, so we construct this by, by gluing particles. But to, to define this error from gluing, we have to go back to something. It's like mean value property. You know, uh, in, in complex analysis, there's a very well-known formula like you have a ball, right? And value in the ball is average over the boundary, OK? So here, this error estimates, it's just like, uh, OK. It's basically generalization of this average proper. Because so instead of my ball is now Voronoi cell, and my discrepancy is value of gradients. And I would like to deal with value in the center. I like this idea. This is called regularity. But you imagine that instead of the classical mean value property, which you learn in college for complex variables, it's for Laplacian. Here, remember I showed you this is uh, Edwards Berry nonlinear equations. So you have to basically, that gives you an idea how complicated, even for dilute limit, when you go to real problem. So in order to prove approximation, even for dilute limit, you have to construct some sort of generalization of mean value property, and then you can, and then you can prove that your solution, which you construct by hand, by gluing these uh, solutions, it really approximates exact solution. So there's a question of hydrodynamic interactions between these objects. Right. Because this is very long range. Yes. So if you treat the object one by one, don't you always ignore the hydrodynamic interactions? Well, to some extent we do. Yes, that's what dilute limit is. And, but then, then, then you introduce correctors. You have to start from something which is simple. What I'm trying to say that in this nonlinear phenomenon, even in nonlinear media, with, with activity, even Einstein result would be very hard. OK? So it's, it's ignored just like Einstein ignored. But then, of course, just like I told you, for, uh, for suspensions, then it was finite. And what even, even close dense, dense to packing suspensions were studied, right? I had papers on that in Journal of Fluid Mechanics. So the same route is here. But we are at the very beginning of this route. It's all clear how it works for Newtonian fluids, for, for, for stocks. Activity, there are two difficult factors. One is activity, and the other is nonlinearity of the media itself, rheology of, 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 of a liquid crystal. Viscoelastic, because if you want to capture me memory, you have to capture viscoelasticity. So, so I have another question. Sure. Which has to do with the Einstein formula. Yeah. So Einstein calculated the linear term, but the, the, there's a further complexity with the nonlinear term, which is that it depends on the Pitkley number. Right. Has different values. Is there anything that plays this role here? Well, we are not there yet. It, it certainly, if there is anything which plays this role, when you try to, it's a, like Bachelor in Green. I was saying that in 70s, they, they managed after 1906, it took, what, 65 years to, to take into account first order interactions. So we can, we can go this road here, but that would be, OK. So we are at the beginning, at the Einstein, we sort of single, but it's still because of nonlinearity of media and activity, both. Mm -hmm. 
So we decomposed difficulty. First, we did activity. That's actually Nitya and uh, uh, Antoine did. They did activity, but in instoxian fluid. That's well understood. But now we are really interested in this Igor's experiments in, in mucus. And here we at the point of dilute, but taking into account nonlinearity of media. That's where we are. Uh, OK. And let me just maybe finish. Uh, so now I was talking about dynamics, right? That's another potential. So you have forcing terms. They influence fluid velocity, fluid velocity interest microstructure, effective rheology, forcing terms. So that's why. I mean, motion of swimmer causes nonlinearity of the effective microscopic model, like in free boundary problem, right? Even if you have linear equation for, for uh, ice and water, then because of free boundary, the whole problem is nonlinear. So dynamics, when you consider even Stoxian particles moving, if, there is, if it's really dynamics, it is already a nonlinear problem. Uh, and so it's sort of like many body problems coupled with fluid long range interaction. Now I'm just scaring you. I'm just telling you what, uh, maybe not scaring, what, I, what is interesting and why it is difficult to go that road where we are now. And of course, the third effect is coupling of scales that uh, microscopic effective equations coupled to microscopic fluid dynamics. Effective fluids dynamics uh, depends on local fluid structure. And uh, again, an evolution of local microstructure depends on effective fluid flow. So this is, this is called coupling of scales. So scales are not totally decoupled. And uh, OK, I think probably the time, this is, uh, this is about random suspensions. What we do, what we did so far, we add some by hands. We add some physics by, for example, saying orientation is determined by Fokker-Planck. Assuming then it makes problem easier. But what I'm trying to say that it's not simple mill field. We have to add, by hands, we have to add some physics, for example, like through uh, Fokker-Planck for orientations. Okay, that's just a simple example which we did for tumbling. Uh, OK, this is about corrector problem. That's we, I talked to you. So that's the heart of homogenization. Corrector is something which is a cell problem, which makes things work, which allows you to compute approximation. And it's very different, periodic, random, nonlinear. Corrector is always the key mathematical uh, issue. Uh, OK, uh, I, I wanted to show you something about stochastic cancellation which my collaborators, there's some effects of random media. This is sedimentation, uh, a pro, a homogenization of sedimentation problem, but maybe it's too much for today. I don't want to do too much. That's about viscoelasticity, uh, Edwards berries. OK, OK. I think we should stop here, because then that's another thing. Yeah. OK? All right. <laughs>